All right, guys, good afternoon. Today's lecture is going to be the final lecture for week three. Um, this lecture that we're gonna talk about right now is gonna be safety. So let's get started. So objectives for this um, lecture is gonna be to identify factors that affect safety in an individual's environment, um, identify patients at risk for injury, Describe health teaching interventions to promote safety for the adult. Describe strategies to decrease the risk for injury in the home. Describe nursing interventions to prevent injury to patients in the healthcare setting. Identify alternatives to using restraints. Explore resources for developing and evaluating an emergency management plan. And evaluate the effectiveness of the safety interventions that we implemented. All right, so safety definition. So providing safety for yourself or anybody else is described as a basic human need. Safety is the freedom from injury. It is providing um, for safety and preventing injury are considered um, major nursing responsibilities. So it is your job when you are taking care of those patients in every aspect um, of the care you provide that you provide safe care and that you prevent injuries from happening to them. Um, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing states that, quote, the nurse promotes achievement of patient outcomes by providing and directing nursing care that enhances the care delivery setting in order to protect patients, family, significant others, and other health care personnel. So that came right from the National Council of State Boards. All right, so we will talk about this um, more in the long, um, in our lecture when we go live for our Zooms. But some of the things, if you're listening to this beforehand for you to think about, or what, are you, what do you think some safety concerns are for patients that are in the hospital or in a long-term care facility? And what are some safety concerns slash risks for patients in their own home, especially when you think about the older adult? So just some things to think about, and then we will talk about that um, when we meet. So factors affecting safe delivery of um, safety for your patients. So determining, actually factors affecting how safe a patient can be, if they're gonna have an injury or not, I apologize. So their lifestyle has a part to do with it. So what kind of occupation do they have? Do they sit behind a desk every day and they answer phones and they, you know, um, copy things and they work on a computer or do they drive a truck for a living, you know, which increases their risk for being in a car accident? Do they operate huge cranes? Do they walk on big scaffolding and up the, you know, do they build skyscrapers? So depending on their occupation, um, their risk of having a, an injury certainly rises. Then you have your social behavior. So do you drink a lot of alcohol? Do you do drugs? Are you smoking cigarettes? Do you have a lot of stress? Do you have a lot of anxiety? And then um, you want to think about domestic violence too. What is your living situation like? Um, are you with someone who has a domestic violence problem? Are things at home just stressed with finances and you know not having enough money and stuff like that? And then you have the environment. So you want to think about pollution and violence. So, um, you know, what's your city like? What kind of crime rates do you have where you live? Um, do you live by a lot of um, electricity towers? Do you live by a lot of pollution? What's the water like where you are? Do you have a lot of noise? And then you have mobility. So what's your mobility situation? If your mobility is in implemented in any way, shape or form, you're automatically at risk for having an injury if you cannot walk properly. And then sensory perception, I think we talked about this before, before with our patients that have had chemo and our patients who have neuropathy because of diabetes, they don't have um, that, that good sensory perception, like the feeling in their hands and the feelings in their feet. So it would be very easy for them to have some type of an injury or um, some type of a trauma to their skin and not know that they had it. Um, and then knowledge, you know, how educated is your patient? Not everybody has a clear understanding of exactly what's going on. And if people don't understand certain situations, that puts them at risk for having an injury and not being safe. Um, and then ability to communicate. 
you know, maybe they don't understand, they can't communicate properly, or they've had some type of an injury that prevents them, you know, um, they might have like expressive aphasia or something like that, and they can't communicate, and that can impede them being safe. Um, their physical health state, you know, how healthy are they? Um, if they're not healthy and they can't stay at home by themselves or they're not able to take care of themselves, that's not a safe environment. And then you want to think about their psychosocial state too. So psychosocial and physical, you know, they're both very important. If you're not mentally stable, then that also impacts your safety. So risks to safety related to the developmental age. So the child. So Nurses do play a very pivotal role in promoting safety in the client's home and community. Nurses often collaborate with the client, which is, you might hear client and patient use interchangeably, they're the same thing. I, I usually like to just say patient, but I do have it throughout here that says client. But when I say client, just know that I mean patient. So they often collaborate with the client, the family, and the members of the interprofessional team, which is your social workers, your occupational therapist, your physical therapist, all to promote the safety of the client. Um, so there are threats to safety or, that are definitely influenced by your developmental age. So in small children, Injuries are the leading cause of death and disability. And usually the type of injury is directly related to their developmental age. So some examples of that are your infants. So, you know, you always are gonna worry about suffocation. You know, do they have covers around their face when they're in their crib? Do they have stuffed animals in their crib? Do they have crib bumpers around that they could get their head stuck under and suffocate? So those are some safety issues for infants. Then you have toddlers. Well, you know, they're always on the move. They're very, very curious. They're getting into everything. So you, want, you worry about them playing outside if they have some type of an injury. You know, most toddlers don't have any fear. They don't understand um, what a safety risk is. They just want to go, go, go and have fun. So are they climbing on things, you know, putting things in outlet sockets? Do they drink things that are laying around that somebody left out? Could be some type of a poison. Um, did the parents not um, put away the guns in the house and the child got a hold of the gun? We've heard that story more than once. Um, and then pools, you know, children are left unattended or they just are quick and they're sneaky and they get by somebody and before they know it, they're in the pool and they've drowned. So definitely seeing that correlation between the developmental age and the safety risks that um, could happen to them. And then you have your adolescent, your teenagers. So, you know, their risks are drugs, alcohol, sexual activity, car accidents, things like that. But if you wanted more information on that, you can just go to page 765 and then table 27.1 gives you more information about that. So what type of people are at risk are at high are at risk for having falls? What we would consider a high fall risk. So definitely that older adult, age older than 65 years old, when they have that decreased strength and endurance limitations, they become weaker as they get older. So you always hear about that in the older adult, they're at a risk for falls or they have had falls. Um, if your patient has a documented history of falls, have they already had a couple falls before or one fall before? If they have, they are automatically at risk for having another fall. Um, if they have impaired vision and sense of balance, that makes perfect sense, right? If you don't have good vision, you can't see where you're going, you don't know what you're doing, you're at risk for falling. If you don't have a good sense of balance, you're not gonna be able to ambulate properly in your house or anywhere else, increasing that risk for falling. Um, altered gait or um, altered pressure. So um, if you have any problems, if you have a leg injury or um, maybe you have a prosthetic leg, anything that could alter your gait puts you at risk for having a fall. Then you wanna think about your medications, okay? So what kind of medications are your patients taking? Are they taking diuretics, which influence your total circulating volume, right? Which can lower your blood pressure. Are they taking tranquilizers, which can make them sleepy and also have an effect on that um, respiratory system and circulating volume? Then you have your sedatives, your hypnotics, and your analgesics, all going to have an effect on that blood pressure and respiratory rate. And if their blood pressure drops, what are they at risk for? Yep, hypotension. Hypotension leads to falls. Um, if they have any cognitive dysfunction, you know, if they don't really have a firm understanding of their safety awareness and what's going on, they're at risk for falls. We talked a little bit earlier in a couple slides, a couple lectures back about postural hypertension or that. Um, 
orthostatic hypotension, so when they're changing that position from lying to sitting to standing, um, if, they, if their blood pressure drops, then they can get dizzy and have a fall. Um, slowed reaction time. So as, pa as people get older, their reaction time does slow down a little bit. So if they're driving in a car or if they're getting out of a car and they see that something's in their way and that they're going to fall, they might not be able to prevent it in time. Um, if they're confused or disoriented, well, you know right away if they're confused or disoriented, they are going to be at risk for having a fall because they don't have a firm understanding of their environment, their safety awareness. They don't really know what's going on. The impaired mobility, again, um, if they're weak and physically frail, if they have diseases like multiple sclerosis or um, cerebral palsy, and then even if they're just in an unfamiliar environment, um, you know, that's not a good feeling being somewhere where you don't know where everything is and it's easy to get up maybe if you're spending the night somewhere where you don't usually stay and you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and it's dark and you don't know what's going on, it would be easy to have a fall. So those are all the environmental risks that you have to think about when you're trying to determine if your patient is a high fall risk. So here's some interesting fun facts. Falls are the most common reason for admissions to hospitals for injuries for the geriatric patient. Um, I can attest to this. I can't tell you how many, I feel like at least lately, except for COVID, I feel like at least once or twice a week, I got a patient that would come in because they had a fall. It's so, so common and it happens all the time. And it is costly. So it can cost upwards of $50 billion annually. It costs Medicare $29 billion a year, $12 billion for private and out-of-pocket expenses, and then Medicaid pays about $9 billion a year towards um, injuries related to falls. They are preventable, so clinicians can use something called STEADY to prevent falls and reduce costs. And it's pretty common. One in every four adults older, 65 or older has a fall each year. So definitely that geriatric population. All right, so the most common injury from a fall includes hip or other fractures. I can attest to that. I see that all the time. Poor little older patients, men and women come in, they have a fall and their hips break. You know, you're older, you don't absorb vitamin D very well, you get osteoporosis, your bones are fragile, it's a bad combination. Um, then you have the head trauma, or the soft tissue injury. Um, injuries from falls may also go unreported because older adults feel fear activity restrictions. That is so true. I can't, I've taken care of so many patients that live alone or they live at home with their wife or their husband and maybe they're a primary caregiver and they don't wanna to go to long-term care. They don't wanna leave their house. They want to always be able to stay home even if they live by themselves. So they don't report them because they don't want anyone to put them in a long-term care facility or tell them they can't go home. They don't want them to, to tell them that they have to go to rehab to get stronger. Um, so they don't tell what happens. And even if they did have a fall, they will just consist, always tell you over and over again, I'm completely fine. I'm never going to have a fall again. That was an isolated incident. So it makes it really tough when you're trying to provide care for them because they don't have an easy time dealing with it. Um, they don't want to lose that independence or like I said, be placed in a long-term care facility. Each year, at least 300,000 older people are hospitalized for chip fractures. I cannot talk again. Do you see a pattern here? I don't know what's going on with me. Hospitalized for hip fractures. More than 95% of hip fractures are caused by falling and usually by falling sideways. Help, I fall and then I can't get up. I think everybody knows that motto. So what are some contributing factors? Um, musculoskeletal changes. So as adults get older, they have decreased muscle strength. We talked about those brittle bones. And then postural changes can affect um, their risk for falling, getting that orthostatic hypotension. Um, nervous system changes, such as their reflexes are slower, their sensation to touch is decreased, and they have a decreased ability to respond to multiple stimuli. There's sensory changes, vision and hearing impairment, okay? Transmission of hot and cold impulses is delayed. Um, communication, impairment related to hearing loss or aphasia. And that, then that, um, those GU changes, so nocturia, right, which is, being, is going to the bathroom multiple times during the night, and then incontinence. So that's a bad combination. Patients that have to get up frequently in the middle of the night, they wind up tripping, getting into the bathroom, or if they have this incontinence or urgency, they're getting up, you know, in a hurry trying to get there, and then they have a fall. So... 
Analysis of fall with injury, according to the Joint Commission. So analysis of falls with injury in the Sentinel event database reveals that the most common contr contributing factors pertain to um, inadequate assessment. So th this is like talking about in the hospital setting, okay? Why do um, Sentinel events happen related to falls in the hospital. So inadequate assessment. So when that patient's coming in, is that nurse accurately performing that um, fall risk assessment? So according to the documentation that you do in the hospital, you're only required to do one assessment a shift. Well, depending on what's going on with your patient, um, for example, when they come in, they might be a really high fall risk because they were so sick and they couldn't get out of bed and their blood pressure was low. Well, maybe two days later, or just even later in that shift, they're you know they have really made progression with their um, the way that they feel, and they're able to get up now and walk around the room. So even though your documentation only requires you to um, record that assessment, that fall risk assessment once, if things change for your patient, you want to record it again. Okay, you're doing your patient and a severe injustice if you don't. Um, and then something to think about is sometimes, you know, maybe they come in and they're on a lot of these medications that put them at risk for falls, but then maybe they wind up not taking them or the doctor makes changes. So you would want to do that fall risk assessment again. Or if the doctor adds medicines, maybe they weren't a high fit fall, fall risk before in the morning, but the doctor did their rounds and they've added two new medicines that put that patient at risk for falling. So you would want to redo that, um, that assessment. So communication failures. So examples of that would be, you know, in the morning when I get report on my patients after I get settled and I meet my patients, I go and I find my tech and I do a bedside report with them. You know, this is guy's a high fall risk. This guy's a two two turn. We need to have a plan for the day. He needs to have his call bell in reach. We got to make sure that bed alarm is on. No exceptions. So when that doesn't happen, and patient nurses and techs don't communicate, that's when falls happen. Um, Lack of adherence to protocols and safety practices. Again, so if our protocols are that every high fall patient that comes in, we give them a red bracelet on their arm, we give them a pair of red socks, they have to have a sign on the door that says high fall risk, and we have to have that bed alarm on. So if we don't adhere to those things, transportation can come by and try and take the patient for a test, and if they don't have that red bracelet or red socks, they're going to assume they can walk. And some of these patients can literally have fallen down 10 minutes ago and not been able to get back up. But if somebody walks in the room and says, Mrs. Jones, can you walk to the, to the wheelchair? She'll say, yes, sir, I can, and try and hop right up out of that bed. It happens every time. So not adhering to our protocols and safety practices, implementing those, put your patients at risk for falling. Um, this is a big one. Inadequate staff orientation, supervision, staffing levels, or skill mix. So I can't tell you how many times I worked a shift that I didn't even have a tech, and I had five patients. Two of them were totals, and three of them were high fall risks. You're only one person. You can only be in one place at one time, and if you don't have an extra pair of hands, things happen and people get hurt. Um, so that's a big issue. Then you have deficiencies in the physical environment. So I guess if um, a good example of that would be if your patient is on, um, if they are a high fall risk and maybe PT got them up and they want them to sit in the chair. Well, if we didn't have enough chair alarms for the patient, that would be a deficiency, you know, in things um, not being able to keep them safe. And then lack of leadership. So if you don't have, you know, a good leader that advocates for, the education of her staff and encourages her staff members to go to these safety meetings and learn evidence-based practice to keep patients safe, then, you know, these falls are going to happen and patients are going to get hurt. So falls can be categorized. So they can be accidental, which is, you know, clutter or a spill caused a person to trip. You could have an anticipated physiological fall, which is a direct consequence of gait imbalances, um, effect of the medication that you gave them. Maybe you gave them a new heart medicine and it really dropped their blood pressure um, if they're confused because they have dementia. Then you have unanticipated physiologic falls, which are caused by unknown or unexpected medical issues, such as a stroke or a seizure. And then you have intentional falls, which um, occur when patients act out behaviorally with the intent to fall. So they're trying to get a rise out of you, they're trying to get attention, and they just throw themselves on the floor. And I have seen that more often than I probably ever should have, but it does happen. 
um, fall prevention in the home environment. So what do we want to tell our patients that they need to do at home to keep them from having a fall? You want to educate them about safety issues, okay, things that put them at risk for falling based upon their um, their house and their issues. You want to make sure that pathways are clear so when they're in the home and they have to go, you know, if you know that they have to go to the bathroom frequently or urgently at night, you want to make sure that in their bedroom to their bathroom is a clear path, that there's not tables or books or boxes or piles of clothes or anything that could, um, or throw rugs that could make sure that that would, um, you know, allow them to be able to trip and impede their ability to walk. You want to maintain proper lighting and use night lights. So I have night lights all throughout my house and it is great because sometimes when you get up in the middle of the night, your eyes just aren't working, even if you're young. Um, so make sure that they have night lights around, secure all carpeting. If they have any carpeting that's coming up anywhere, make sure that handrails are tightly attached and sturdy so that if they do have to hold on to something, you don't have to worry about it giving way and them falling. Encourage them to never place or leave anything on the stairs. Wear properly fitting shoes and slippers with non-skid surfaces. Place both matte or non-skid strips on bathtub or, shore or shower floor. So I think we've all seen those before. You just, you can buy them in the store and some of them are little suction cups and they just stick right to them. Some of them, they come in a big pack and it's like one huge bath mat, but that'll keep the patient um, from falling when they're in the shower. And then you can make sure that they install grab bars on walls around the tubs and the shower. So in case they are feeling not okay, you know, if they're dizzy, they have something to hold on to. And then if they have a low toilet, you can install a toilet seat riser so that it's easier for them to get up and down. And then you wanna move hard to reach items to lower shelves. All right, nursing preventions to prevent falls in the healthcare facility. So you wanna complete, like we said earlier, that fall risk assessment for each client at admission and regular intervals. You wanna indicate the risk for, patient, for falling, for failing, that's not right. Indicate the risk for falling, I apologize, um, or, and put it on a sign on the patient's door and the chart. We don't really have paper charts anymore, so we would just wanna put it on the door. Um, you wanna use those fall risk alerts, right? We talked about those red bands and those red socks. It's different colors for each facility. My facility has red. Um, orient the client to the room and the environment when they come in. This is your call bell. If you're confused, you hit this button here. We'll be able to help you. Over here to your right is your sink. This is your toilet. Let me show you where the bathroom is. Um, place clients at risk for falls near the nurse's station. We always try to do that. Sometimes you can't because those beds aren't available, so they do have to go further in the back of the unit. But then the charge nurse on our, at our hospital always keeps a list of patients that need rooms closer to the front. And then as those rooms clean up, we move those patients to the front. And then you provide hourly rounding. So that's one of the things I talk about with the tech when I give report in the morning. And we will automatically decide what hours she's gonna do and what hours I'm gonna do. One will take evens, one will take odds. And if we can't get to them, you know, if we can't get to our turn, we just touch base with them and let me know and then let them know. And then, you know, one of us picks up the slack. Um, nursing intervention to prevent falls again in the healthcare facility. So we're going to keep that bed in the lowest position. Always make sure that the brakes are locked. We're going to keep the wheels on the bed and wheelchairs locked. Be sure that the client knows how to use the call light bell and that it is in reach and encourage its use. Because if you walk out of the room and you don't give them their call light and they're a high fall risk and they have to go to the bathroom, how do you expect them to call you? They can't. And then what are they going to do? They're going to get up and go because they have to go and it's not a good feeling to have to sit in bed and hold your urine or your stool when you really have to go bad so they won't have any other choice but to get up but if they have that call bell you can educate them about hitting the nurses button and let us know and then we'll come and help you and then you want to the other part of that is responding to that call light in a timely manner now i've seen you know especially when you're short staffed and it's not ideal but it happens if you're only one person and you have three patients that are high fall risks and you know, you're already in one room with another and everybody else is busy, you can't get to that patient. You know, um, So what happens is that they wind up getting up on their own and then the alarm goes off. And that doesn't always happen, but I have seen it happen and it's not ideal, but that's the cost of having being short staffed. It comes at a cost and it's usually patient safety. Um, 
You want to provide regular toileting and orientation of clients who have cognitive impairment. So what I like to do right before shift change is I go starting at six o'clock, I go and I meet all my patients go to talk to my patients again for the last time. And if they are high fall risk, I make sure they have everything they need. Do you have to go to the bathroom? Do you need anything to drink? Do you need any pain medicine? Because I know between seven and 7.30 is an off the chain time for that shift change report. And it's a, a time where if patients need something, they wind up waiting longer because patients, and I mean, the nurses or the techs are giving reports. So I try and avoid that by touching base with them patients, doing that last hourly round, rounding and make sure that I'm meeting all their needs before seven o'clock. And then it's always good to leave a night light on in the hospital or a bathroom light or a little cabinet light. Um, you can provide non-skid footwear and non-skid bath mats for use in tubs and showers. We don't usually have, we don't have tubs in the hospital, but we do have the showers. Keep the floor clean, dry, and free from clutter with a clear path to the bathroom. Um, leave water, tissues, bedpan, urinal within the patient's reach. Use gate belts and additional safety equipment when you're moving clients. And then make sure to document and report any changes in the patient's cognitive status to the physician and other nurses at the change of shift. All right, you wanna use, um, whoops. You wanna use electronic safety monitoring devices such as those chair or bed alarms we talked about. Um, if you have a patient that's impulsive and you know that they're gonna get up without you, without assistance, um, you wanna put those bed alarms on and chair alarms on. Even if they are complete alert and oriented, they promise me, I've heard it before from the sweetest little 85 year old grandma who I absolutely loved. Oh, Miss Trish, I would never get up without you. I am so scared to fall out. I will always call you. Well, don't you know, there she is 25 minutes later, sitting on the floor next to the bed, had to go to the bathroom, forgot to call. And then you go in and they're like, I forgot I had to call. I didn't think I would fall. Famous last words. I never listen to any patient. If they're a high fall risk, that bed alarm is going on because I can't be in five places at one time. Bed alarm has to be on if they're a high fall risk. Um, use alternative strategies when necessary instead of restraints. So if you have a patient that's confused and they're getting out of bed and they're pulling at their lines and they're ripping out their Foley's and catheters, you always want to use the least restrictive um, strategy, okay, to keep them safe. So you're not gonna have a patient that pulled out her IV and automatically put her in four point restraints, okay? That's really not warranted. And you don't always have to go right to restraints or medication, you can go to distraction. So sometimes we'll give them wash rags to fold. On the units now we have, um, they don't go into COVID rooms, but we have these little dolls that have little, um, outfits on and they can lace up the laces, they can buckle the shoes and stuff like that, like kind of like just to keep their hands busy. Um, we do that for them. Then we also, if they still don't want to sit in bed, then we bring them out to the nurse's station. Or if it's your patient and you're just charting, you can, and your other patients are okay, you can sit right there in the room with them. Um, so we really try to do everything we can before we put them in those um, restraints. And then you wouldn't just, if they, you do think they need restraints, you wouldn't just go to those four point restraints. You would go to some hand mittens and we're going to go into restraints. We have a whole lecture about them, but you would go to the hand mittens first and then the soft restraints. Um, and then if the restraint is applied, if you have to do that, you're going to make sure you're following your company's policy, which where I work, it's every two hours, you're going to be assessing that patient, um, taking off those restraints, checking the skin, is there any skin breakdown, are they hurting themselves, do they have to go to the toilet, do they need anything to drink or eat, um, are they okay to come out of the restraints, or do I have to put them back on? You want to report and document all incidences, and then, because this provides valuable information that can help prevent similar incidents. So restraint-free environment. The current standard for long-term care facilities is to provide safe care without the use of physical or chemical restraints. So chemical restraints is what you would, would be medications that you give them. The Medicare, the Joint Commission, and other regulators require that restraints be medically prescribed and that you try all less restrictive interventions before using them. 
So your fall risk, fall risk assessment tools, um, that fall risk score that you're going to fill out in your documentation, it's going to look at the level of consciousness of the patient. It wants to know their age. Have they had any prior history of falls? What's their elimination status? Are they incontinent? Do they have urgency, frequency? What's their vision status? Do they wear glasses? Are they blind? Do they have any ambulation or gait um, issues? What's their systolic blood pressure? What type of medicines are they taking? How many medications are they on that could contribute to a fall? Is there any patient care, patient care equipment that they have on? So do they have oxygen and a catheter and IV tubing and a chest tube? Well, if your patient has all of those things, even if they're 15 years old, they're probably at risk for having a fall, right? Because you can you imagine trying to get to the bathroom and carrying all those things in a small room? And then you want to know any predisposing diseases that they have that would increase their risk of falling. Then you fill this assessment out and it gives you a score. So at my facility, zero to six is low fall risk. No, zero to five is low fall risk. Six to 13 is like a moderate risk. And then... Um, yeah, thir 14, 13 and up is uh, 14 and up is high fall risk. All right. So in general, the use of restraints for the shortest duration necessary is the way that you use restraints, and only if your other restrict your least restrictive measures are not sufficient. So have you tried to keep the patient busy? Did you pull them out to the nurses' station? Did you you know uh, try all those things first? And if you have, and they're still pulling on their lines or trying to hurt themselves or somebody else then you can put them in some restraints, but then only for the shortest amount of time possible. Um, nurses must know and follow federal, state, and facility policies for the use of restraints. Um, my facility makes us do yearly competencies, and there is a competency on restraints, so we go through them often. Um, restraints are either physical, so physical includes devices that restrict the movement, so you can have a, um, a vest, you can have a belt, um, you can have chemical, restraints such as sedatives and neuroleptic and psychotropic medications to help calm the patient. You want to reduce the risk of patient injuries from falls. You want to prevent interruption of therapy. So if they're pulling out their IVs and their catheters, they're not getting the treatment that they need um, to be able to get better. You want to prevent the confused and combative patient from removing life support equipment. And then you want to reduce risk of injury to not only yourself, but the patient and others. So if restraints must be used, the nurse needs to, first action is to encourage a family member to stay with the patient. So that's not possible right now because of COVID, so we don't have any visitors, but I would never hesitate to call home and say, oh, Mrs. Jones, your husband is very confused tonight. Um, we're having a hard time keeping him in bed. Is there anybody that can come and stay with them? Because even if they're confused, usually they will recommend, they will recognize a family member or that family member knows how to deal with them. And it's more comforting for the patient because these patients are confused and they think they're at home and they want to get up or they want to go downstairs or they're, you know, they don't know where they are and it's real to them. They really are confused and they think that what's going on is, is real. Um, you want to discuss the intervention with the physician and obtain an order. So what we do as nurses is if we um, have a patient that is acting out and they're pulling on their restraints, you can put, we put mittens on them or whatever we need to, to get them safe and from not pulling on things. And then my next phone call is to the doctor. The doctor comes and sees the patient and then he puts an order in for the restraints. Um, you want to protect the patient's rights, their dignity, and safety, so only using them for as long as is necessary. You don't want to just put them in restraints and leave them there for the entire shift because you don't want to be bothered with them. You need to go in every two hours. Let's take them off. Has the patient calmed down now? Maybe he just needs them at night. A lot of people sundown, so come 6, 7 o'clock in the morning when the sun comes up, little Mrs. Jones is back to being her sweet little peachy self because it's daytime again, and she becomes oriented and more pleasant. I always say that they're like gremlins at night, you know, with gremlins, I don't know how many of you know gremlins, but if they used to get that, they used to be so cute and fuzzy and then you get them wet and they turn into these wild animals and wreak havoc on the whole city. Well, that's kind of like what it's like when patients sundown, they're so sweet and cute during the day. And that's what you tell the nurse when you're leaving, you're like, oh, you're going to love Mrs. Jones. She's so cute. And then you come back in the morning and the nurse's hair is pulled out. She's completely bald. And she was like, oh, you lied to me. Mrs. Jones is not nice, but they can be two different people between day shift and night shift. 
Um, you want to make sure that they have the right to go to the bathroom. You want to make sure they have food and water. Okay. So choose a restraint device that best minimizes the client's mobility. So four point restraints are not required for just someone who's pulling out their IV. Mittens are probably help, um, helpful. And then choose the least restrictive method. We said that. Um, yep. Examples use a wrist restraint for a patient. Yeah. That's attempting to move out of IV. All right, if restraints must be used, the nurse needs to document each occurrence of restraint use, ensure that only properly trained and authorized staff apply and remove restraints, and then you want to discuss and inform the patient and the family of the need for and type of restraint use. Because you, if you have to put on a restraint for your patient and your loved, their loved one is coming back later, that can be extremely upsetting if they come in and they see their loved one in mittens or if they're restrained to the bed. So you always want to be mindful of that and make sure that you contact that family and let them know, hey, Mrs. June, Mrs. Jones was a little upset today. She was very disorganized, very um, confused and disoriented. She was pulling out her IV. We're trying to give her this IV antibiotic. She really needs it. Um, the only thing that we could do to keep her calm was to get put her in some soft wrist restraints, which we do currently have her in. We don't want you to be alarmed when you come in. We're only going to use them as long as we can. Hopefully here shortly, she'll be reoriented again or she'll be calmed down. Some kind of conversation like that is what needs to take place. Um, so if restraints must be used, the nurse needs to never interfere. Restraints should never interfere with the treatment. Restraints should restrict movement as little as possible. You don't want their arms and legs completely chained down to the bed so they can't move at all. And they should be easy to remove or change for you, not for the patient, but for you. You want to choose the correct restraint size. If a restraint is too small, it can cause agitation and injury to the skin. If a restraint is too large, the patient can slide down in the restraint, which could lead to entrapment. Now, I don't think it happened at our facility, but I do remember them teaching me when I was in my nurse residency program about a patient who was disoriented and this, the nurse put her in um, a roll belt, which attached to the bed and then around their waist. Well, she wiggled and wiggled and wiggled and wiggled and she wound up, she basically hung herself in the, in the restraint because it got wrapped around her neck and it choked her. So I feel like for a while after that, we didn't use roll belts, but now we actually, I've seen them in our Omnicell, our supply closets again. So I guess we're back to using them, but it's, you just have to use them very cautiously. Um, if it is inappropriate to use restraints for, um, if you have, you know, short staff, you can't just say, oh, I only have two nurses tonight, we're going to put everybody in restraints. That's not ideal. Um, if your patient doesn't eat their dinner or they want to take their medicine, it can't be a punishment. Um, and then clients who are extremely physically or mental un mentally unstable, wow, that might be an alternative that crosses your mind. It's not appropriate, and we certainly cannot do that. So this is just a little picture of the type of restraints. So this is just a, a normal hospital bed. These are these soft wrist restraints that I talked about, okay? These are some leg restraints. And then these can also be used for, um, these are leather restraints. You could use them for the legs or the hands. I've never used them or seen them. I see these and I use these all the time. Um, these are the mittens I was talking about. These are um, safety belts for the wheelchair. This is that roll belt I was talking to about in the bed. And these are vests. though. So, so this would go on the patient and then it would attach to her chair to keep her in the chair. Then you have bumpers here um, to keep that patient safe in case they go to get out of bed, they don't hurt themselves. This, I've never, ever, ever seen this. It looks like some kind of contraption that they put their hands in. The picture's not real clear, so I, I'm not sure. Um, this was Miss Kemsky's picture, so I am not exactly sure what that is, but I've never seen that, but it definitely is some type of restraint. Now this, this is really cool. I've never actually seen this in the, in the clinical setting, but it's kind of like just a giant enclosed playpen that you would, um, put your patients in and zip them up and they wouldn't be able to get out and they would still be able to move around the bed. They'd still be able to remove their stuff, so it's not ideal for that, but um, yeah, that's pretty wild. I've never seen that before. So um, protective devices restraints. So a physical restraint is any manual method of physical or mechanical device, material or equipment attached or adjacent to the person's body that 
the person cannot remove easily that restricts freedom of movement or normal access to one's body. In the late 1970s, more than 25% of clients in long-term care facilities were restrained compared to the current average of 5% today. That's a huge difference. Um, side rails to the bed, putting all four side rails up on the bed is actually considered a restraint. You need a doctor's order to do it. Um, you cannot put all four side rails up. Geriatric chairs with attached trays is a resort, is actually, excuse me, a restraint. And then appliances tied at the wrist, ankle, and waist, waist we've seen those. And then your chemical restraints, which we said are um, medications used to help calm the patients. All right. Okay, so restraint orders. You, there must be a physician's order for the restraints that you put on that patient within 24 hours. Um, and it must include the type of restraint being used and the reason why the restraint, restraint is necessary. And it has to be renewed every 24 hours. They're only good for 24 hours. So what I like to do as a nurse is I like to say, Mrs. Jones is in soft wrist restraints. Um, she still requires a need for them. At my last assessment 20 minutes ago, um, there is an order in there currently right now for restraints, but the order expires at eight o'clock tonight. I always like to tell them when it expires because I don't want them to have to find that on their own. And I want them, because it's very important for you to get that order before um, that order expires. When they audit charts, people will, you know, they'll take note of that if that order expires and patients are still in restraints. Um, you want to have the orders may not be written as necessary, so um, four-point restraints as needed for behavioral issues. It can't be like that. It has to be very specific, and it can't be standing in case you need it. You either need it or you don't. Um, and orders need to be written every time the restraint is required. So if I come in at eight, at seven o'clock, and the nurse going home tells me that Mrs. Jones um, was in restraints overnight, and then she's just sitting there so cute and so pretty and so sweet, and I don't think she needs restraints because she's been just lovely when I've been in the room with her, I take them off, and then a half an hour later, someone throws water on her like those gremlins and she turns into this little monster again and I need restraints. I can just put them back on, but I need a whole new order. So once the order is discontinued, you need a whole nother order again. After you put those restraints on, you get that order, a face-to-face -face evaluation by a physician within designated timeframes is essential. So each hospital or each facility has their own time frame. I think it's four hours at my facility. Um, that doctor has to come up and to put uh, their eyes on that patient. And then orders are only valid for a specific time frames based on the purpose of the restraint. We talked about that. And then you're always going to want to monitor your agency's regulations. And they do audits on these. They do audits on everything. They do audits on caudies and um, <sighs> catheters and central lines. And they want to make sure that all this thing is being done properly because if not, then patients are at risk and restraints are no different. So I always, you know, make sure that I get my documentation done and it's documented every two hours and everything is included. All right. So for restraint monitoring, what does the nurse need to do? You're going to want to assess that patient and then document that behavior that requires the continued use of the restraint. So not every four hours, not every six hours, not once a shift, every two hours or more, you need to have your eyes on that patient because you need to keep in the back of your mind, this is a very temporary situation. You're only using this for the least amount of time that you have to. It's essential that you move and progress and get the patient out of the restraints. Um, protect the patient from discomfort and or injury by removing anything that can be used for self-injury. And going back to the, um, we're using these restraints for the limited, the most, um, the smallest amount of time possible. I see it all the time where patients that are older are going to rehab, you know, just to get a little stronger, or they're going to long-term care because that's where they're going to live. And if they have not been free from restraints for 24 hours, they cannot go back to the care facility or the long-term care facility. So if you know that that's the condition, you know, that that's going on with your patient, this is where they're going, you really want to make sure that um, you get them out of their restraints so that 24-hour clock can start ticking. 
You want to make sure that when they're in these restraints, you're offering them hygiene, comfort. Are they comfortable? Can I readjust your pillow? Are you cold? Are you hot? Do you want something to drink? Can I order you some lunch? Do you need to go to the restroom? Regularly assess the patient for continued need for the restraint. Um, tie a quick please quick release knot and place the restraints correctly. Do not tie the restraint to the side rail of the bed. You want to always tie the restraint to the bed frame, some part of the bed that does not move. Because if you put it on that bed, that side rail, and then that rail goes up and down, you can hurt the patient. You want to choose a restra um, restraint device that best minimizes the client's mobility, which would be that um, the wrist restraint. Um, then you would, when remember to when applying restraints, clients must be reassessed within four hours. Well, in my facility, it's two. Um, and then provide range of motion every two hours. So when you're going in and you're taking those restraints off and you're looking at um, the skin, you're making sure you're stretching their arms, stretching their legs, making sure you're getting some good range of motion in there. So restraint monitoring. Check the extremity at least every two hours for circulation. Does you have good capillary refill? Is there good blood flow to the arm? Um, do they have good range of motion? Do they have to be repositioned? How is their oxygen? Um, what's their skin integrity like? Is it too tight? Does she have burns on her, you know, her arm from turning them in the restraints? Are they red? Is the skin broken down? These are all things that you want to look for. Oops. Okay. So documentation, the nurse needs to clearly document patient restraint, which includes the behavior that led to the restraint use, the alternative interventions used prior to restrain, um, to the restraints that failed to be effective and the type and location of the restraint applied. So these are all things that um, I fill out all the time when I have a patient in restraints. So why did I put them in restraints? They were pulling at IVs, they were pulling at medical equipment, they were trying to hurt themselves. What interventions did you choose prior to those restraints? Um, I kept the door open. I did frequent visits. I kept the um, area where they were quiet. I um, did frequent um, orienting, reorienting them, talking to them. I, you know, you always want to say that you applied all these things first, which you do before you had to go to this measure. That's like your last resort. So. You want to, you families and patients, um, you want them to be understanding and consent to the application of restraints. So you want to be very thoughtful about how you um, tell a patient's loved one, husband or wife, son, daughter, that you have to go in restraints. You want to um, speak to them kindly. And like I kind of did before, I gave you that example. You don't want to call and say, um, Mrs. Henry, your mother is off the chain tonight. She's ripping at her IV. I have four other patients. I can't deal with this. She's going to have to go and in restraints if you don't come in here. That's not the way you want to handle it. You want to be very um, concerned. You want to, you know, explain to them why you have to do it. You know, even sympathize with them. I know if you come in later and you see this, this is, might be a little upsetting for you. I want you to know that we're using the least restrictive restraints for the least amount of time possible. But your mom is really confused right now. She doesn't understand why she's getting these antibiotics. She pulled out her IV and then she tried to pull out her Foley. If she tries to pull out her Foley, she can do a lot of damage to her urethra because there's a bulb in there that is actually, um, blown up to help keep it seated in the neck of the bladder and if patients pull that out then it can cause bleeding and trauma. So once you um, kindly explain that to you, the patient's families they're completely usually I've never had a family member that wasn't um, on board with that and if they weren't then they were usually willing to come in and sit with them and that's perfectly fine too. That's actually ideal. So if that happens, that's even better. So the documentation needs to include frequency of monitoring, circulation, range of motion, skin integrity, if they're in any pain, what's their orientation status? Did you reposition them? How's their oxygen? The frequency of the provision of hygiene, comfort, food, food and um, elimination. The behaviors that re require the need for continued restraint and the patient's behavior after you remove the restraints. So we will talk about this ne these next couple questions um, when we come to our live lecture. So actually, we'll just skip over these and then we'll do them in lecture. So organizations that promote safe patient care, there's the American Nurses Association again. 
Um, we keep hearing about them. So the ANA Health System Reform Agenda 2008 recommends public safety um, changes. And then the Quality and Safety of Education for Nurses, that CUSIN, is that task force to improve nursing education. They identified six competencies that all nursing students should have by the time of graduation. So safety again, right, is minimizing the risks of harm to patients and providers through both system effectiveness and individual performance. So the 2015 National Patient Safety Goals for Hospitals, one of their goals that they decided was to identify patients correctly. That was an important goal. So things that they put in the place to be able to do that was to, they want you to use at least two identifiers when you identify your patients. So for example, you want to ask the patient's name and date of birth. That is our policy at our hospital. You always have to ask the patient their name, date of birth, look at their wristband and compare it to your MAR. Um, it's done to make sure that each patient gets the correct medicine and the correct treatment. It's a great check. And then make sure the correct patient gets the correct blood when they get a transfusion. And there's a whole nother safety system in place for blood administration as well. Another goal is to improve staff communication. So get important test results to the right staff person on time. Um, use medicine safely. So before a procedure, label your medications that are not labeled. Take extra care with patients who take medicines to thin their blood. So if you know if their blood is thin, you're not gonna wanna use that razor, right? To shave their face, you're gonna wanna use the um, electric razor. You're gonna wanna make sure if they're a high fall risk that you're even extra attentive to them because if their blood's thin and they have a fall, well then they could have, you know, like a brain hemorrhage and they could bleed out. We don't want that to happen. So now we have, all right, they want you to use medicine safely, so record and pass along correct information about a patient's medicines. You wanna find out what medicines the patient is taking and compare those to medicines, compare those medicines to new medicines given to the patient. So whenever I um, get a patient from the emergency room, there's always a medication list in the computer, and as part of the database that I do, I always review their medications, and if the patient isn't, um, able to go over them with me if they're just too sick or maybe they're not really coherent. I call the emergency contact and I go over it with the son or the daughter or the spouse or whoever is their emergency contact. You wanna make sure that the patient knows what medications to take when they are home so that um, that discharge, the education you're gonna do with your patients is really huge for when they go home. You wanna make sure that they know exactly what they're doing. You might have to take their, um, you might have to take their discharge papers and highlight things, put stars next to them, put nights, little notes on them for them so they know what to do when they get home. And then you wanna tell the patient it's important to bring their up-to-date list of medicines every time they visit a doctor. I always tell them. And if it's not them, if I don't think that they're competent enough to do it and they have a loved one, I always tell them, when you go home, write down all your mom and dad's medications. If you have brothers and sisters, give your brothers and sisters a copy, make sure that their loved one has a copy, put it in the car, you know, have a copy at the house, so that way whoever brings them into the hospital, because if the patient comes in, for one, if they are alert and oriented normally, if they don't suffer from dementia, they might not be alert and oriented enough at the time to tell what their medications are because they're just too sick. And then if they do have dementia and they're, you know, they have to come out on an ambulance, they're not gonna be able to tell the hospital what they take. And it's really important that we know what medications they take. So you wanna make sure you use those safety alarms. Make, um, they want improvements to be made to ensure that alarms on medical equipment are heard and responded to on time. So when your patients are on cardiac monitoring, you wanna make sure that all your alarms are set, the volumes are turned up so that you can hear it um, when it goes off at the nurse's station from no matter where you are. Um, more patient safety goals, prevent infection. So the CDC reports that almost 2 million patients will get a hospital-acquired infection. Nearly 90,000 of them will die. That, that, those are huge numbers. And they're, it's preventable. Hospital-acquired infection. We talked about this before, right? These are never events. The hospital will never, ever receive money for this. But even worse than that, 90,000 of the 2 million patients will die. That's uncalled for. This comes, you know, every, pe every person in the healthcare team plays a 
vital role in keeping these patients safe. And it's very important that we all do our, our job to contribute to keeping that patient safe. So we, you wanna use the hand cleaning guidelines from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention or the World Health Organization. You wanna set goals for improving hand cleaning and hand hygiene. We talked about that before with the little secret shoppers that run around and then they, they calculate who did it and who didn't and then you get a percentage sent to your unit. And if you get a good percentage, you get food. Everybody in the hospital gets fed food when they do something good. And then if you don't, well, then you get a little nasty, nasty note to your email that tells you, hey, you guys are not washing your hands. You guys need to step your game up. So more things to do um, for preventing infection. Use private guide proven guidelines to prevent infections that are difficult to treat, that MRSA, the VRE. Um, so stop um, prescribing antibiotics so much, right, when they're not needed so we don't develop these super bugs. Use proven guidelines to prevent infection from blood and central lines, so using that um, aseptic technique or sterile technique. Use proven guidelines to prevent infection after surgery, and then use proven guidelines to prevent infections of the urinary tract that are caused by catheters. So we talked about that nurse driven protocol when the nurse has the right to remove that catheter when they think the patient doesn't need it anymore so that it doesn't stay in too long and they don't get an infection. Um, use the guidelines, so you use that sterile technique when you're putting it in, right? And then we talked a couple um, lectures back about cleaning, right? Cleaning that, um, in hygiene, cleaning that catheter from the meatus down um, between seven and 12 and then between 12 and seven again during each shift. Identify patient safety risks. It risks. Find out what patients are most likely to commit suicide. So if a patient tells you, you know, that is one of the things that I have to answer in my database. There's a long list of kind of uncomfortable questions. Um, have you been abused or threatened by anyone close to you? I know them all because I've been saying them for years. But then there's a section that says, do you have a history of any suicide attempts? Do you have any plans to harm yourself or others? Do you have any thoughts about harming yourself and others? And then if they say yes to any of that, then you want to say, what are your plans? Um, and then they would automatically get themselves a sitter because they're not allowed to be left alone. And then um, they would be moved to the psychiatric unit at the hospital if they had beds available. Um, prevent mistakes in surgery. So make sure that the correct surgery is done on the correct patient and at the correct place on the patient's body. So do you remember what, what we did? We talked a couple lectures back about what you can do um, to make sure that you're when you're in the operating room that everything goes smoothly and that you've had all your um, checks and balances. We talked about doing that timeout. So this is when the surgeon stops. So this is Mrs. Jones. She's a 25 year old um, white male, she, uh, well, female. She um, is presenting today to have a right knee replacement. We marked her right knee. They would pull the cover back, look at the right knee. It has an X on it. Um, and that's how they do a timeout. You wanna, we just talked about that. Mark the correct patient's body part and then calls before the surgery. Do that timeout. So improve the effectiveness of caregiver communication. You wanna do that read back requirement um, with when you, um, are talking and you're telling Mrs. Jones's husband when your wife comes home tomorrow. This is even more important now during COVID because those loved ones, they're not sitting there at the bedside going over discharge instructions with their family members. The doctors don't usually go over it on the phone with them. And if they do, it's a very abbreviated version because they're so busy. So the nurses really wanna make sure that their family members understand you know, what's going on when they go home. So. Mr. Jones, I know your wife is going to be coming home soon. We, I'm including her discharge instructions in her white bag, but we did make some medication changes. She is no longer taking her um, metoprolol anymore. She now started taking digoxin, and she's going to take that two times a day. Mr. Jones, can you read back to me what I said? Do you know the changes we made to Mrs. Jones's medication? Then he would read it back, and then if he said it correctly, then you, that would be fine. And if he didn't, then you would just go over it with him again until you had a firm um, belief that he knew what he was talking about. Um, if you're getting verbal and telephone orders, they must be verified, right? So you wanna write down that order, you're gonna read back that information to the doctor, and then you're gonna have them confirm what you read back was correct. You don't, um, do not use lists that include abbreviations and acronyms that are not to be used because they can be um, mis 
you know, lead and they might think that there's something else if they have something that's similar, you know, the same three letters and they might think you're talking about something else. So never events, we already talked about these, healthcare acquired complications, which Medicare will no longer reimburse institutions for. So that's the severe pressure ulcers, any falls and trauma. Now pressure ulcers are what happens when the patient stays in the same position in the bed without being frequently um, repositioned. It can take eight to 12 hours, just one shift for someone to get skin breakdown. And then, you know, you have what we call like a blanchable area where it's red, but when you put your finger on it and then you let go, you put your finger down, it goes white. When you let go, the redness comes back, which means there's still blood flow. And we'll learn more about this as you progress through this um, program, but you know, then it's non-blanchable anymore, which means it's red and it's not getting any blood to it. And then the area opens up and then it turns into a sore. And then before you know it, you know, within a matter of weeks, it's down to the bone. So pressure injuries, ulcers are preventable. They should never occur and they will not pay for them anymore. So any kind of falls or trauma related to falls in the hospital, infections associated with them, urinary catheters, NIV catheters, and surgical site infections following certain elective procedures. So a sentinel event is an unexplained occurrence involving death or serious physical or psychological injury or the risk of death or injury. This is not something you ever want to happen in your facility. They do happen, um, few and far between, but they do happen. But it is something that you would want to prevent. So other safety interventions you want to put into your practice is always use infection control measures. So if you are caring for a patient with COVID and you know that the proper protocol is to wear a gown, gloves, your N95 and your face shield, that's what you should be wearing. So you can't cut corners and say, I'm just running in to grab this off their bed. I don't need to put anything on. That puts you at risk. It puts other patients at risk. So you need to follow those established infection control measures. Always follow hand hygiene guidelines. So when you're handling a patient with C. diff, you know that alcohol-based um, sanitizer isn't going to cut it. You need to use soap and water. Always be prepared to do CPR, okay? Whether it's your patient or somebody else's, you always need to be in that mode that if something happens, you have to start compressions. Know your facility's fire and emergency plans, right? Usually the fire plans we call RACE. So R stands for rescue. You're going to rescue anyone that's in immediate danger. A stands for alarm, the fire code system, and you want to get that fire code system Sometimes it's just a, a little box that you break. Sometimes you open it and you hit a button. You want to notify the appropriate people. C means confine. confine. You're going to close all the doors and windows. And then E is you're going to extinguish to get that fire out. And then... Um, emergency preparedness. So you need to be prepared if a disaster strikes. So a tragic event of great magnitude that requires a response of people outside the involved community. So hurricanes, tornadoes, um, things like that, that are unexpected, that are major disasters. Um, they involve all hands on deck because there's just not enough people at that time. So we need to be educated about what to do if an event does happen and how we would serve our population of people. Any kind of natu natural disaster like floods, any man-made disasters, so toxic spills, war, terrorist events, bioterrorism, which is the um, deliberate spread of a pathogenic organism into a community to cause widespread illness, fear, and panic. So something that comes to mind with that for me is COVID. And then you have chemical terrorism, which involves the deliberate release of a chemical compound that has the potential of harming people's health. You have nuclear terrorism, which is intentional introduction of radioactive materials into the environment for the purpose of causing injury and death. And then you have cyber terror, which involves the use of, the, of highly technological, high technology to disable or delete critical infrastructure, data, and information. And that does happen in hospitals. It just happened at my hospital not too long ago. And um, it really wreaks havoc on your system when you can't, it really affects the, the level of care that you can provide your patients because you're used to being, having everything right there at electronic. And then all of a sudden you have nothing and you have no papers and you have to start all over. And it's, it's very difficult to work like that. So 
um, that's, this is the end of safety. So our next lecture that we're going to be talking about is going to be evidence-based practice.